morning I know we'll want to be remembering in our prayers and throughout the day and the days ahead uh, those individuals in New Zealand who suffered, family members have suffered the loss of great tragedy that took place there, similar to many other tragedies that have taken place around our world. But I believe God is able to take these tragedies and bring people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ would encourage us to pray this way, even as we've been reminded this morning to pray for those in China. I think of those in India. Our friend Saji Lucas is over there right now, and, and a great deal of persecution uh, continues to grow and develop in that country as well. We are living in a day when the primary focus of most people is me. In fact, you may remember that the baby boomers were nicknamed the me generation. And that's been several decades ago. It was back in the 18, uh, 1800s. <laughs> yeah, maybe then too. Back in the 1980s and maybe the 1880s. Actually started in the 70s because the 70s was actually labeled the me decade. Oh, the time when people were really interested in, uh, you know, uh, themselves. Um, there was a cover on Time magazine that literally said the me, 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 me generation. And uh, the me's were just all over that cover. Some of the characteristics of that, people became really conscious of uh, need for health, exercise fads, human potential, finding yourself, and then that very favorite of thing, shopping, consumerism, buying. In fact, as my friend Paul Meyer used to say, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the eyes was the desire to buy everything in sight. Uh, scripture commanded in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not covet. And uh, the me generation turned covetousness into an art form. We learned how to covet our neighbor's house, our neighbor's car, our neighbor's dog, our, everything you could imagine. And so self-fulfillment became the mantra of the day. Remember programs, uh, television programs like Father Knows Best and the Waltons? They were replaced by Seinfeld. And the people who wrote Seinfeld put it this way, was a TV show with no conscious moral purpose. It was just there to entertain. And uh, that became sort of the mantra. Now there's still a lot of the me generation around in our world today, even the 21st century. Uh, it's not gone away. But it's certainly not the focus that the Apostle Paul had when he wrote to the church in Philippi. Remember, he talked to them about joy and talked to them about happiness. Happiness comes when you have all the stuff you want to have, when you do all the things you'd like to do, when everything's going smooth and easy and just about right for you. But joy happens no matter what the circumstances are when your confidence is in the Lord and you're trusting in Him and you're allowing Him to work through the circumstances. And someone has put joy this way, Jesus first, others second, then yourself. You spell it out, Jesus first, others second, then yourself. And um, a lot of people, some people don't like that, but some people do. And I think in a way you could say that that's kind of where Paul is going to wind up this book of Philippians talking about generosity and gratitude. Now, who are the people with generosity? The Philippian people, and we're gonna see that in our passage today. Who was the person with gratitude? The Apostle Paul. This entire letter is permeated with thank you, thank you, thank you. And isn't it appropriate when somebody does something for you to say thank you, to express your thanks, to express your appreciation? Paul has done that in these Four chapters and I hope we have appreciated this remember as we got into chapter 1 the context of the book Paul talked about joy it began with the theme of grace in chapter 1 in verse 2 grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 1 one of the highlights was in verse 21 for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain was centered in him our focus when we do communion is that we are focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 2 and verse 5, he pleaded with them to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. 
He went to the cross. He humbled himself, became obedient to the death of the cross. And then God highly exalted him. And then we get to chapter 3. And Paul's prayer there is that I may know him, verse 10. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformed to his death. And then in chapter 3 and verse 14, in light of knowing him in this way, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I haven't attained. I want to encourage you to join me as we seek to be closer to Christ, to live for Christ. And then we get to chapter 4. Paul hits a number of issues. He says, first of all, stand fast in the Lord. Don't give up. Don't let discouragement overwhelm you even when circumstances are difficult. And he says you need to be in harmony with each other. And he actually calls out a couple of the ladies, Euodia and Syntyche, tells them to live at peace with one another, tells others to gather around them and, and fellowship along. And then he says when you're worried about things, now I won't take a poll this morning and say how many of us have any worries because I wouldn't want anybody to be tempted to uh, lie in church. That would not be good. So, uh, but I will say this, Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, always replace worry with prayer. Whenever you find yourself worrying, pray. You have something you're worried about, family member you're worried about, a situation you're worried about, a health issue you're worried about, turn it over to the Lord in prayer. And he says the result is you'll experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. And then he goes on from there, having talked about how we can experience the peace of God, to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can face any situation, and I can handle any circumstance. I can handle rejection. I can handle deprivation. I can handle health issues. I can do all things, not some things, not a few things, not many things, but all things. And that's the promise to the believer is God's provision. I can, by the grace of God, resolve conflicts. I can trust God for needs to be met. I can handle adversity when it comes along. I'm living in China, I can handle the persecution. If I'm living in India, I can handle the persecution. If I'm living in the United States, I can handle the affluence that comes along and God can give me grace to put him first in the face of that. Then he gets to verse 14. He doesn't want the Philippians to misunderstand. He commends them for their gift. And that's what we find in verses 14 through 16, the commendation that was elicited by their gift. He wants them to know that he's grateful. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. And he points to their immediate gift, their present gift that they gave. They apparently sent that by Epaphroditus. He had come to Paul and brought a financial gift. And he said, you did that and you did well. Generosity is always commended by the Lord. Stinginess is not. Most of us remember the uh, famous Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. And that well-known Ebenezer Scrooge who was not a generous man. And yet, as God worked on him through the ghost of Christmas past and the ghost of Christmas present and the ghost of Christmas future, he came to understand the importance of generosity. And the end result is, you remember, was Tiny Tim filled with turkey and all the trimmings saying, and God bless us, everyone. God loves generous people because God is a generous God. God gave the ultimate gift in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I enjoy salvation and all its benefits because of that. And no matter what our circumstances here on earth, we have heaven to look forward to. And I guarantee you, there won't be any diseases in heaven. There won't be any broken toes or broken bones in heaven. There won't be any conflicts with family or friends in heaven. There won't be any financial shortfalls in heaven. There won't be any income tax forms to fill out in heaven. Hallelujah. And all of those other things that irritate us. Trips to the doctor, of which some of us try to make sure we go at least once a week. 
just to make sure the doctors can pay their country club dues, the note on their Cadillacs and their Mercedes. We, you know, we, we do all these things. When we get to heaven, none of those things will bother us because our generous God has provided us with salvation. But in light of this, Paul says, your gift did well. And so as we see a brother or sister in distress, we have the opportunity to do what these Philippians did and do well. And that brings me back to the announcement that we've heard a couple of times today, and that is that we're going to have an occasion next week to bless Mike and Viviana. No, that's week after next. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, it is not next Sunday. It is Sunday after next, the 30th. This is the 31st. 16th, 31st. This is the 17th. Anyway, you read the calendar, you can figure it out. Don't trust me to read your calendar. But 31st on that Sunday, we will have that special event. We'll be talking about it again next week, but it just fits right into the message today. So let's be preparing for that. But here's the thing. Paul not only wants to commend them for their current gift, he's going to talk about their past faithfulness as well. Look what he says as he points out in verse 15. Now you Philippians... Know also, he says, you remember that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Now, think about this. It had been 10 years before Paul in Acts chapter 16 had come to Philippi. He had met with a group of people uh, led by a group of women on the riverbank and they were having prayer meetings and Paul gathered with them and uh, Paul wound up getting locked up in jail because he had cast a demon out of a, a girl that was a fortune teller and uh, while he was in jail, do you remember what he did? He griped and complained at midnight. No, they sang hymns at midnight. And God opened the prison doors and brought them out and the jailer and his entire family were saved that very night. And God began to add to the church and they began to grow. And when Paul left there, after not too long a time, that church got involved in supporting Paul's ministry. You know, one of the things that I've always been thankful for, you know, all the churches that I've pastored, and I've had churches that I've pastored and churches where I was an interim, and every single one of those churches has supported missionaries. And I'm very thankful that this church supports missionary endeavors. God blesses us when we look beyond ourselves and we see a world in need of a Savior. And we may say, and I, I've heard people say this before, and sometimes I've actually heard this in a business meeting, well, we can't afford to give too much to missions because we've got to take care of the light bill at home and we have to pay the preacher. We, I know we want to keep him poor and humble, but we've got to pay him something so we can't afford to give to missions. I want to tell you, churches can't afford not to give to missions. We can't afford not to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. God will take care of those needs. These Philippians were a good example of that. God blessed this church because they looked beyond their immediate circumstance and they gave. And he said, 10 years earlier when I first preached there, you were the only church supporting me when I left there. You were the only one, Paul says. No other church partnered with me. That was the word shared there, literally meant partner. In fact, when he used the phrase concerning giving and receiving, this was a common phrase that was used of a business transaction made in that day and time. In essence, what he's saying is, you made it your business to do it decently and in an orderly fashion, to regularly, faithfully support me. And he pointed out that even when I got to Thessalonica, and Paul was only there for a few weeks, he wasn't in Thessalonica very long, but he said, you sent two different gifts, financial gifts, to my ministry once and again for my necessities. And Paul is very grateful for their past faithfulness. But I want you to notice not only his commendation, but the fruit that was produced by the Philippians, verse 17. Not that I'm seeking the gift, but I seek the fruit that may abound to your account. What Paul is saying here in essence is, I am very grateful that God has led you to give. You see, uh, here's his first negative that he states. The negative issue is not the gift that matters, it's not what Paul received that mattered to Paul. In fact, Paul was a lot like a parent 
When a parent receives a gift from a child, can you think back to when you first received a gift from one of your kids, those of you who are parents? Or maybe a gift from a grandchild or a great-grandchild? You know, it wasn't the size of the gift that mattered. It wasn't the price tag on the gift. It was the act of giving. It was the fact that they thought about you. And that's exactly what Paul's saying here. He says, God's going to give you fruit. It's going to abound to your account. Now, I know that there are people out there today preaching name it and claim it theology and telling you if you'll give $100 to God, He'll give you back 1000 I want to tell you, that's not what this passage is saying. What this passage is saying is that God is going to give you fruit. Now, He is going to say God's going to supply your needs. But basically, what He's saying is you Philippians are building up fruit. You're building up a reward in heaven. And the reality is, Paul says, your account in heaven, and we Christians all have an account. Did you know you have an account in the bank of heaven? And you need to be investing in that account right now. And your generosity in giving is the way that you invest in that account. And that's exactly what Paul's telling the Philippians. He's saying, you folks are doing it. You have done it. You're continuing to do it. And Paul says, that's what I'm really grateful for. And he says, I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not trying to, to uh, manipulate you into another gift. Look at verse 18. This is where he goes on to talk about the impact illustrated by their gifts. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. In other words, Paul says, I have everything I need. I've received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. And then notice what he says, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. Now Paul's not saying that uh, they sent him a boatload of Chanel number no. five. That's not the point of the passage. What he's saying is, this is like an aroma to God when you gave this gift. And it's very similar. In fact, the only other place this kind of phrase is used is used in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2. When Christ sacrificed himself, that was an aroma well-pleasing to God. The picture comes out of the Old Testament when they offered offerings on the incense altar. And he says that was pleasing to God. And he says Christ's gift of himself was pleasing to God. What we celebrate at the Lord's table. And he says, your gift, your generosity to meet my needs, Paul says, that's an aroma. But then notice what he goes on to say. He said, you've given to me, you've given generously, and he knows that they have some needs. And so he adds, and the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And verse 18, he talked about the abundance of their gift. Now he's going to talk about the superabundance, we might say, of God's promised provision. My God shall supply all your need. This is one of people's favorite verses, one of the great promises in the Bible. I want us to take it apart for just a few minutes here. Uh, we'll not take a lot of time, but I think... Uh, the first thing we need to do is to point out that this verse is found in a context. Uh, back when I was in Bible college, one of our professors used to say a text outside of a context is a pretext. You always need to put verses in the Bible in their context. And when God says, my God shall supply all your need, he does so in the context of the Philippians what? Their generosity. Their giving, their ministry to Paul, their meeting needs. So he's not just giving us a blank check or an ATM card on the bank of heaven. What he's doing is he's saying, I'm promising you that God will meet all your needs and particularly, specifically, as you generously give to God's work. So the context is their generosity. The second thing I see here is that it's the character of God that's on the line. Paul says, this is my God. Paul had come to faith in the Lord God on the road to Damascus. He had come to know about God, about His Son, Jesus Christ. He had preached God. He had been persecuted for the sake of God's gospel. And Paul says, I know my God. I know He'll take care of you. I remember years ago, when around the time Kathy and I were getting uh, married, um, 
and that's been a few years ago. Uh, Kathy had an uncle who owned a tugboat company, lived over in Vicksburg, <coughs> Mississippi. And when members of the family had needs, uh, there were people who'd say, we know Jesse Brandt. We know he's generous. We'll know, we know he'll take care of their needs. And often he would. I can remember a couple of times when Uncle Jesse gave me a $100 handshake. You know what a $100 handshake is? It's a handshake with a $100 bill hidden inside a Benjamin, right inside the palm. And, uh, but see, Paul says, I know my God. And Jesse Brent has limited money, even though he had a lot of it. Bill Gates has a lot of money, even though he has a lot, he's a limited amount. That guy up in Omaha, Nebraska, you can remember his name, I have trouble remembering. Uh, owns all kinds of stocks. Got loads of money. The wealthiest people in the world. Their wealth is limited. Paul says, my God is unlimited. My God is unlimited. And then out of that, he says, He will supply, He will provide, He will fulfill all your what? Needs. Yeah, not your wish list, not your wants. You may want that BMW convertible. You may want that nice new house that's very much like the nice new house that a family or a friend has. You may want certain vacation. Uh, maybe you've got friends that took uh, spring break and went to Disney World or went to Hawaii. In fact, I uh, saw a little note posted with pictures, some friends of ours that we've done radio ministry with, they had their whole family in Honolulu and uh, standing on the Waikiki Beach. And I thought, boy, that's a nice place to be. I hope y'all don't get sunburned. <laughs> but you see, he doesn't say all our wants. He says, my God will supply all your needs. Everything you need. And that word all needs to stick in your mind. You have a need. God knows that need. And God is capable. And God will supply it. Not our greeds, not our wants. But it's consistent with His riches and glory. And it's all ultimately by Christ Jesus. And so, the ultimate thing that Paul is telling us here is trust God to meet your needs. If you don't take anything else away from today's message, I want you to take that away. God blesses generosity and God's provision will make do for all of your needs. And Paul, in light of this, breaks into a, a doxology in verse 20, talking about the abundance of God's glory. Now to Him be glory, our God and Father, forever and ever Amen. And you'd think, okay, Paul's finally through, but he's got a few more words. Final greetings and grace. Verse 21, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. Remember Paul's writing from Rome back to Philippi. He sent this letter by Epaphroditus, and he says, I want to greet every one of you. Paul knew those people. He was aware of them. I'm sure he prayed for them, and he wanted to greet them. And he says, these brethren who are here with me, some of whom you know, Timothy, you know, Epaphroditus, they're sending greetings as well. And then in verse 22, I love this. Greetings are expressed to all. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Now that may look like just a little phrase that's stuck in there. But I want you to think about that. It's a remarkable evidence of the power of God. Because here are these individuals who trusted Christ. And there could have been some soldiers. Remember, some of those soldiers were on shift duty with Paul. Paul was chained to soldiers while he was in jail in Rome. You know what Paul talked about? He talked about football or basketball or the, the Sweet 16 or the Elite and the Elusive 8 or whatever. He didn't talk about spring training in baseball or what the Cowboys have gotten in free agency. Paul talked about Jesus Christ all the time. And some of those Roman soldiers came to know Christ. And then there were probably Roman slaves, slaves of Caesar and his household that came to faith. But I think that in that phrase, Caesar's household, there were some of the people who were actually some of the major officials, some of the key people that God had reached out to and brought to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through the testimony of of the man who was a prisoner for Jesus Christ. And then his final word, verse 23, 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Remember, he started with grace, chapter 1, verse 2, and he ends in chapter 4, verse 23, with grace. But it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul said to live as Christ and to die as gain. He said, my goal is to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, to be made conformable to his death. And I say to you today, the ultimate example of generosity is Christ who so loved us that he laid down his life for us and gave his life that we might be saved. If you've not yet trusted him as your savior, I encourage you to take that step today. And for each of us who have trusted him, may God lay upon our hearts to be generous with the resources that all belong to him in the first place. Father, thank you for this time that we've shared together in the Word of God. Thank you for this great book of Philippians, how it's ministered to our hearts. Use this time together, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen.